Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send it to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because they do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father and you will see me no longer. About judgment, because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Happy and happy birthday, church. Happy birthday, dear church. Today is Pentecost, one of the four major festivals of the church year. Today we celebrate the coming of the God Spirit, the Holy Spirit into the lives of the men and women. Today we celebrate the birthday of the church. Today is just as important as Christmas, Easter, and just as important as the festival of the Ascension. Four major festivals of the church. Let me ask you this. How much of the Spirit do you have? Saint Peter. Saint Peter quoted the prophet Joel at some length. Most of the quote from Joel does not seem to have much or anything to do with the Pentecost. In Peter's sermon that follows our context, there are two parts of the Joel with which he makes a definite connection. It is the first part and the last part. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And it shall come to pass that whoever call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So first of all, Peter says, that the speaking in tongues on Pentecost was prophesied by Joel. Men and women of the small community of the believers were speaking out the wonderful works of God. Everyone could understand them in their own language. That seems fairly obvious. But the implications drawn from Joel are huge. God was doing this to show that he was pouring out his spirit, not just on these few people on Pentecost, but upon all flesh. By this, we can draw the meaning that there would no longer be only one or a few prophets to tell the word of God, but an abundance of the preachers of the God's word. We can draw the meaning that even those who are not ministers of the gospel will have a fullness of the Spirit on them. Not only those who preach, but those who believe the preacher's gospel will receive the Spirit. Obviously, it is not that all flesh has the Spirit in the sense that every single human being now has faith. Nor do sons and daughters all prophesy in the same fashion 
since in the New Testament women are still forbidden from the preaching office. Yet women also may faithfully speak the word of God outside the office of the pastor. They do not have less of the spirit. The spirit given on Pentecost did not come once, never to come again. So where, 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 where is he? Do we look for signs like the tongues of fire or speaking in tongues? Wrong Christian leader, they are pretending. Tongues of fire and speaking in tongues. Of course, the spirit might be around, but there are no miraculous signs. Yet we know that the preaching of the word is accompanied by the Spirit always. The Spirit has bound Himself to the Word of God so that where it is taught in its purity, there He is working to commit, to forgive, and to convert, to regenerate, to sustain, and to protect. We should picture on any day when the word of God is preached, that the flame of the Spirit is here. The burning visible sign may be absent, but the Spirit is not. And what is the visible sign compared to the salvation of the souls? The Spirit is not so much concerned with making a show as He is about bringing His mercy and grace to mankind. In Peter's sermon that follows, he specifically connected Christ to the sign of the Spirit coming. He says, Peter says, Therefore, Christ being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He, our Lord Christ, pour out this which you now see and hear. That's from Acts 2 verse 33. That is, Christ the Lord is ascended and has set out upon the disciples and upon his whole church his Holy Spirit. In Joel, it was God who sent the Spirit. Because Peter draws Joel together with the Pentecost, we must conclude that Jesus is God. Jesus is God. He is equal to the Father, sitting at the right hand in glory. This man who is God and the Lord of his church has sent the Holy Spirit so that we can be filled with the same Spirit. Are you filled with the Spirit? Yes, you are. I can prove you later. The last part of the quote from Joel is that Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This mentioned also from St. Paul from Romans chapter 10, 13. Now, what does this have to do with the Pentecost? Well, since the Spirit is sent out, then the Word of God is being preached in abundance and with the power so that all who believe shall be saved. But it does not exactly say that. Some may press the word call on the name forcefully as if a person must make an outward appeal to Christ in order to be saved. But that would leave out infant and the young who cannot outwardly call upon the name of the name of the Christ. As if to clear up this question. In his sermon, St. Peter, Peter mentioned the name of the Christ just once. It is in the context of the both, the forgiveness of sins and the Holy Spirit. He says, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and your children, and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. 
That's from Acts chapter 2, 38. We know that where there is the, the remission of sins, there is also life and salvation. We know that the washing of the regeneration and renewal is always a way that the Holy Spirit is poured upon all flesh. We know that these things are also for children. We know that in baptism, the name of God, including Jesus Christ, is putting upon each baptized soul. Or we might say that the name of the Christ is called upon the person. So, to put it all together, to be baptized is to be saved by calling on the name of the Lord by the power of the Spirit. Let me ask you one more, one more time. Do you have Spirit? Do you have Holy Spirit? Yes, you do. You can know this. You don't have to feel it. Feelings may be seen. As I always said, do not trust your feelings. But Christ has given us signs and places where He pour out His Spirit upon us above, from above. If we go to those places and receive the gift through the which the Spirit works, then we have the Spirit. How much of the Spirit we have is not the question. The Spirit is Almighty God full of the mercy for sinners. If you have the tip of the, his pinky, if there was such a thing, that would be enough for a thousands and millions of salvations. You have the Spirit. Very sure. Now, if you reject the Spirit by rejecting the things He gives, that is a whole other question. If you have heard the preaching, but then you start pushing away the word of God from your life, then you are pushing the spirit away. If you have been baptized, but you do not care whether you live in repentance or whether you are part of the church, then you are pushing the spirit away. But why would anyone do that? The Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord, sitting in glory with His Father, has sent down the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, to give you all His gift, eternal life, forgiveness of sin in the blood of the Christ, resurrection from the dead as Christ was raised, hope and joy and faith and perseverance. These are all free gifts that He pours out on you from the benefit of Christ, the Son of God. Since He is such a fantastic giver of gift, why would we push Him away? Some do, maybe most of do, but let us not be them. Instead, we rejoice in the overwhelming glory of God's salvation, that He has made us His dwelling place, His temple in which the Spirit lives. Now this, none of this is deserved. So we rejoice that the Lord is so generous with us, all sinners. I'm finished my sermon today. Let me ask you one more time. Do you have Holy Spirit? So many people Pastor, I'm not sure. But one thing, one, one thing, I will guarantee you. You are here because Holy Spirit woke you up this morning. Without Holy Spirit, you cannot come here to worship service. That's why all you have Holy Spirit right now. That's the one thing I'm very sure. Without Holy Spirit, you cannot sing. You cannot join worship service. You cannot worship God. So you have the Spirit. Use your Holy Spirit to your family, to our neighbors, to whole simple, simple nature. So please be with the Holy Spirit and receive the Holy Spirit. 
and listen the last, last my word, not my word, the word of God. If we hope for what we do not see, right? God, we cannot see. If we hope for what we do not see with the perseverance, we wait eagerly for Holy Spirit and second coming of the Jesus Christ our Lord. It's a long time, right? After Jesus promised to us over the 2,000 years. But you know what? God, God's patience We do not have patience. Even one year, two years, we maybe give up. God never give up for his children to save. So God is waiting. God still waiting for all children to come to his blessing. Amen. <coughs> Please rise. Our hymn of day 390.